Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 52, and we are in verse 13, and we're going to read to chapter 53 and verse 12. A man of sorrows. There's a natural break at verse 12 of chapter 52. And verse 13 is a paragraph in Hebrew that goes on to the end of chapter 53. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him or because of him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, our message? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and With his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and we've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid, hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And all God's people said, Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful passage quoted so often in the New Testament of what happened to our blessed Lord, you told us that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. We remember in the volume of the book it is written, he came to do your will, O Father. He said, not my will, but thine be done. And by his once for all sacrifice for sin, we are set free, we're redeemed released from bondage, delivered from sin, death, and hell. It's hard for us to imagine that by faith in what he has done, we will live forever forgiven, cleansed, washed, justified, sanctified, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, new creatures in Christ. And we want to thank you, Lord, 
For worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive all the glory and honor and power and blessing. We praise you in the wonderful name that is above every name, the name of our blessed Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We uh, mentioned that the comfort of God from chapter 49 to 57 is based on God's servant. And we've looked at two things already about that servant. One was his covenant in chapter 49, verses 1 to 12. And then secondly, his comfort, chapter 49, verse 13 to chapter 52, verse 12. We're now ready for the third thing about God's servant, and that's his comeliness. Old English word used in our text for beauty. And it's not done here so that he would be attractive in a physical and human sense, for he indeed was not through this experience. The comeliness of the Savior was smashed, crushed, bruised, marred beyond recognition. And I want you to see a number of things in this passage, and I hope it will be a blessing to you as it has been to me in studying it. Nine things I'm going to point out to you. Let's start with the end of chapter 52, verses 13 to 15, and that's the astonishment of others. If you're following the text, uh, it says, as many as were astonished at thee. The New International says, appalled. And there's a play on this situation, as in verse 13, we see the exaltation of his wisdom. It's a very interesting thing. When it says, my servant shall deal prudently, New International translates correctly, he will act wisely. The exaltation of the wisdom of God. And then there's a threefold statement that follows it. Exalted, extolled, and be very high. And did you know that's related um, by most commentators throughout history as referring to his resurrection, his ascension, and his enthronement at the right hand of the Father. Kind of interesting, isn't it? That throughout the ages of time until modern times when they almost all ignore it, But ancient commentators looked at it and said, that threefold exaltation of the Son of God referred to his resurrection, his ascension, and his enthronement at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know if it does or not, but I sure like it. How about you? But after giving us the exaltation of his wisdom, we immediately see the extent of his beating in verse 14. He who was the exalted one, he who was the resurrected, ascended, seated at the right hand of the Most High, of the Majesty on High, our Savior, he backs up and says, but to get there, here's what he went through. Behold, take a look at who he is, but many were astonished at him. His visage or appearance was marred more than any other man, and his form more than the sons of men. You should compare the word as with the word so in verse 15. As many are astonished that he was marred, so shall he sprinkle many nations. We'll get to that in a moment. The extent of his beating we're going to describe a little bit more in chapter 53, so we'll save it for that. But please understand that all pictures of Jesus on the cross was simply a crown of thorns and perhaps a little blood coming down from his temples is really not what the Bible teaches. For they try to portray the beauty of his face. There was a beauty in him, our blessed Lord. We know who he is, and that is beautiful. He is altogether lovely in every way. But when you're talking this event, no, you're not talking that which is attractive. You're talking with that which is repugnant and horrible and awful and produces an immediate surprise and astonishment, or as the New International said, appalled at what happened to him. 
He was a bloody beaten mess when Pilate brought him out. What we call today echo homo, Latin for behold the man. It was awful. When they beat his face with their fists, those soldiers on the pavement of the Tower of Antonio, they lost control. The Greek grammar is clear. They just kept it up. They couldn't stop. They were beating up an innocent man, and they beat him to a pulp. And his face was so disfigured and marred, the Bible says, more than any other man who survived that. It was awful. Can you imagine those who loved him, followed him all over Galilee and Judea, when they saw Pilate bring him out, bloody, beaten, bruised, and had the intestinal fortitude to say, Behold the man. (laughs) It was a mockery, but it was a fulfillment of God's word. Amen? Amen. He was bruised for me and for you. Now verse 15 gives you the effect of that beating. When it says two things. One, many nations will be sprinkled. The Hebrew word is used 22 times. And it's primarily referring to the atonement. The sprinkling of blood on the altar. And that's the point here. They're astonished at this beaten up, bruised mess. And that's your Lord? That's the King of Kings? You've got to be kidding me. But the one they were astonished at, he will sprinkle many nations with his blood. Not only will many nations be sprinkled, but the mouths of kings will be shut. As they will realize he who was beaten so severely becomes the Savior of all men. Amen? And the conqueror of all men's hearts. Who turned to him. Now the second thing after looking at the astonishment of people to him and what happened to him. Is what we have in verse 1 and that's the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord. Who hath believed our message? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Go back to chapter 51 please verse 9. Chapter 51 verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. And we mentioned there it is a phrase that is another description of our Messiah. He is the arm of the Lord. In chapter 52, verse 10, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And here's what it's talking about. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Now who's believed that message? And to whom is the arm of the Lord, the true Messiah, been revealed? The third thing, well, but wait, wait, before we do that, go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. One of the interesting things about this passage is the way in which it is quoted in the New Testament. The different ways. Here's an example, John 12, uh, verse 37. It says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, and here's our verse, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom? hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, and we had already studied this in chapter 6, he's blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory. That was Isaiah chapter 6, and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The point is, who's believed the report? To whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Certainly not to the religious leaders who loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Amen? You see the impact and the influence of that verse also in the New Testament. Now back to Isaiah 53 again. 
The third thing I bring to your attention is his appearance. Mentioned in verse 2. His appearance. And there are really just uh, two things that I draw to your attention. One is his identification as a plant. It is one of the terms used of the Messiah in the Old Testament. The sprout, the branch, the root. It says as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. That's how he's going to grow up. Go back to Isaiah chapter 11 and look at verse 1. His identification as a plant clearly, clearly points to his humanity. He's going to grow up among us. He's going to be like us. But there's going to be fruit coming out of this branch and this root like the world could not believe. In chapter 11 of Isaiah verse 1, we read this. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh, Looking down at verse 10. And in that day shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, a banner for the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest that he will give to the whole world who believes in him shall be glorious. So back to chapter 53, verse 2. He was a man. He appeared as a man. He was a tender plant. He was a root out of a dry ground. But secondly, look at the indifference of others to him. Now you can read about this in detail in the Gospels. If you would see Jesus, there was no holy glow or a a sunlight around him or flashing lights coming out of his hair. Uh, There was none of that, folks. And all those pictures in the Middle Ages of our Lord in that way are totally false. He was a man of all men. He was rugged. Uh, He was a mason, a worker, a technician. Uh, The word carpenter, technion, we now know was a stone mason. We believe that we can visit the site where he and his father from Nazareth found employment because we are told from history that the ones who worked on the great city called Sephoris, sometimes called Zippori, Uh, which was a major capital among the Galilean towns of Jesus' day. To those of you who think there was just a few of them, we know from Josephus there were 241 cities in the Galilee alone, and Jesus preached in all of them. And the fact is that he worked as a technion, a carpenter, not with wood, but a stonemason on the great Roman city at Sephoris. That's also where Josephus, Flavius Josephus, was commander of the Galilean forces when Rome first invaded. Then he went over to their side and wrote the history of what took place in Judea and Jerusalem in his wars and antiquities of the Jews. It's quite a thing to go there and walk on those pavement stones from the first century and go to those buildings and touch those stones and realize that the Lord Jesus worked here as a stonemason with his father until he was about 30 years old. He was a man, a strong man. It took strong men to be stonemasons. He hungered and he thirsted. He ate. He slept. He had to get away from people to pray. You know about that, don't you? Especially if you got kids. Amen? you got to find a closet in the house. Jesus said, go into thy closet. But I'll tell you, if they're under the age of, of 10, they'll find you. So it's hard to get away sometimes and be alone with the Lord. But he was a plant. He was a tender plant. He was a root out of a dry ground. And the indifference of others was obvious. It says there's no beauty that we should desire him. When you saw him, he had no form nor comeliness. And look at the way everybody pictures it. He was a rugged looking first century Jew. There was no holy glow about him. We believe he was tall for one basic biblical reason. He could be seen in a large crowd of people as the incident in Jericho with Zacchaeus indicates. That's all we know. Tall for his day, but they were all pretty short. And our Lord was tall and 
there wasn't any real distinguishing features. In fact, he was often mistook for his one of his half-brothers. He said he looked a lot like him. And we should expect that. The fact of the matter is our Lord was human. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But we beheld his glory. We saw that on the Mount of Transfiguration. But that was unusual most of the time. There was no particular beauty or attractiveness about him. And the fact of the matter is it says, point blank, there's no beauty that we should desire him. That's the world's idea. Somebody who's attractive with a charismatic type personality. And that's the one we should follow. No. Jesus was a normal looking Jewish man of the first century. And people were indifferent to the real beauty of the Savior. The fourth thing I bring to your attention, and it seems like it gets more emotional as we move through the text, is that's his acquaintance with grief and sorrow. Verse 3, we sang it in several songs tonight. He's despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. There are two things that are emphasized in verse 3 about his acquaintance with grief and sorrow. One involves rejection. Hard to escape it. Despised and rejected of men. You want to know what the Savior is all about? He was rejected. In John 1, 11, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. Go to Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a part of what we call the Hallel, short form of the word hallelujah. It's Psalm 113 to 118, and these passages were sung at every Passover And all the Levitical choir and all the instrumentalists were all on duty at Passover. Normally they had only a two-week stint working in the temple. But at feast days they were all on duty. And they certainly were at Passover. And all this music was going on all day long while Josephus recorded in his day 256,000 lambs were killed that one day alone. The bleeding of lambs, the killing of them, and the singing of the choir... And in the wrap-up of that Hallel is in Psalm 118. And pick it up at verse 22. The stone which the builders refused has become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I think we don't interpret that song we sing a lot. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. You know, you've sung it. But the fact is, it's not talking about today or yesterday, or I hope I'll have a good day tomorrow. It's talking about the day that Jesus was rejected and died for our sins. And that is something to rejoice about. Amen? Maybe we should change the words and say, that was the day, that was the day. And maybe in English, we would remind ourselves of what it's about. But look at what it says. Save now. That's the word Hosanna. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee. Send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We blessed you out of the house of the Lord, etc. But it was rejected. The builders, the Jewish religious leaders, rejected him. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. When we talk about his acquaintance with grief and sorrow, we talk about rejection. Has anybody ever rejected you? Amen? Now, if they hadn't, haven't done so, cheer up. They probably will. It's coming. You say, I'm 80 years old. It can come when you're old. If you've ever been rejected by somebody, did you ever fall in love with somebody that didn't want you? Amen? Some of you are looking around, well, don't talk about it now. My wife's sensitive. Oh. (laughs) 
Rejection is a terrible thing. But none of us were rejected like him. We read in Matthew 26, verse 3 and 4. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people. That's the Sanhedrin, the Roman puppet government. Under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtly, trickery, craftiness, and do what? What does it say? Kill him. Look at verse 59, same chapter. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Look at chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Go to 1 Peter in the New Testament, chapter 2. We were told in the Hallel that he is the stone that the builders rejected. This one acquainted with grief and sorrow was rejected, despised. 1 Peter 2. Look at verse 6. Wherefore also it's contained in the scripture, and here's another passage from Isaiah 28. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, chosen, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded or ashamed. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. Amen, Christians. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected, the same as made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedience, disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Listen. I'd love to beat the tar out of those religious leaders for what they did to my Lord. Amen? You understand that? You understand the spirit of it? But I tell you something, God was behind it all. God planned the whole thing. God wrote hundreds of years before it happened that the leaders are going to reject him. And they certainly did. They despised him. They despised him for everything he said and did. Because it was totally the opposite of what they were teaching the people. But it not only involved rejection, back to Isaiah 53, 3. His acquaintance with grief and sorrow was just not only rejection, it involved reproach. It's one thing to reject somebody, it's another thing to reproach them. And that phrase, we esteemed him not. It wasn't just that they didn't recognize who he is and thus did not esteem him. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't esteem him with the respect that a normal human being should have. Go back to Matthew 27 again and look at verse 29 to 31. It involved reproach. You want to see what he went through? Verse 29 of chapter 27 of Matthew When they platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, a reed in his right hand. This is the soldiers. They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit upon him. Literally, they continued to spit upon him. They took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him. Imagine pulling that off of that scourging those gouges deep in his back and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. The mocking, the reproach. Verse 39. Here he is on the cross. They that passed by reviled him. They reproached him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Reviled reproached 
Go over to Mark 15 and look at verses 15 to 20. Mark 15. His acquaintance with grief and sorrow not only involved rejection, it involved reproach. Terrible reproach. Mark 15, verse 15. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. The soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. You know, that's 600 strong. They clothed him with purple, plaited a crown of thorns, put it upon his head, began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! They smote him on the head with a reed. They did spit upon him and bowing their knees worshipped him and when they had mocked him they took off the purple from him put on his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him that was my savior they did that too wounded for me says the song wounded for me there on the cross he was wounded for me Back to chapter 53 of Isaiah, verse 4. Let's look at his affliction. His affliction. We are told very, very clearly that he was afflicted. In verse 4, he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The Bible tells us to rejoice in our afflictions. The Bible tells us the Apostle Paul was afflicted. Physical problems, pressure from people, stoning. Our Lord was afflicted. Two things I'd point out to you about verse 4, about his affliction. One, it was endured for others. Don't miss it in the verse. Put your name there if you need to, to see it. It was endured for others. It says he bore, bore our griefs. Literally, it's a word to lift up or to take up. I think the New International, if I recall, does translate it that way. And he carried our sorrows. Let me just give you the words in Hebrews from a little, a literal root standpoint. The first word is to lift a burden, but the second one is to accept it as your own. How interesting. He lifted up our griefs. And he accepted it as his own and bore our sorrows. It was endured for others. There's an interesting way this is used in Matthew. Would you turn there please to chapter 8 of Matthew? As to what his affliction meant when it was endured for others. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 and 17. Uh, Almost surprising how it's used. In verse 16, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, demons. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. How about that? He takes that passage and applies it. To the healing ministry of our Lord Jesus. That brings up the question that people ask all the time. Is there healing in the atonement? I have a little book on the subject. The man absolutely says no. And I keep it close to another book on the subject. He says absolutely yes. Good men have disagreed on this for years. Well, there's one thing for sure. What Jesus was doing in healing people, casting out demons, is a fulfillment of that verse. That's what it says. So let me answer this for you. The greatest healing of all is when you die. Amen? Your miseries are over. Your pain is over. You're going to get a brand new body at the resurrection. That's what I call healing. Amen? That is because he bore your sins on the cross. So is healing in the atonement? Certainly, if you mean the ultimate healing of all. Now, secondly, 
If any healing physical happens in your life, I want you to know that it's because of what he did for you. Let me explain. Why do we have sickness? That's a good question. Don't answer yet, as some of you tried to do just then. Why do we have sickness? Well, I could say it's a result of the curse. After all, man fell into sin, and we got thorns and thistles, and we got problems in our physical body, and we get sick and die, so it's a result of curse. I guess you'd have to say it's a result of sin, because by one man, sin entered the world, and so death passed upon all men. Why do we get sick and die? It's because of sin. But wait a minute. It's also because of Satan. Paul even said in 2 Corinthians 12 that he was buffeted by a messenger of Satan and a thorn in the flesh, a physical problem that he begged God to take away from him and instead heard that his grace was sufficient for him and that God's strength would be made perfect even in the midst of that affliction. So we got Satan, we got the curse, we got sin. So why do people get sick? Well, because of all of it, but... Let's back it up. Why couldn't God have made us in a condition where we never got sick? Well, he certainly could have done it, couldn't he? Was God behind the curse? Was God behind Satan? Was God behind the sin that man committed? Oh, God's not a sinner. And it's impossible for him to lie. But in his plan, was this all a part of his plan? The answer is yes. As a matter of fact, Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The whole atonement, the whole promise of his healing is before anyone was in the world. Everybody okay? We're not done yet. Don't you just want to jump to the conclusion? Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The only way to heal that which is caused by either Satan or sin or a curse is by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no other way to heal it. You say, well, wait a minute. What if I have some medicine and it makes me feel better? Well, where'd the medicine come from? Well, there were chemicals that came in. Well, where did it come from? Well, the dust of the ground. Well, who made that? God did. Amen? So did God heal you when you took the medicine and you got better? Does the medicine keep you from ever getting sick again and dying? No, it doesn't. We can get mad about it and want a new prescription and all of that, but the fact is, some things just can't be stopped. Now, is the point of Jesus bearing our sins and iniquities by his stripes we are healed what's the point of all of that and here we have in 1st Peter 2 24 a clear answer it tells us about how he was rejected yet he didn't respond but verse 24 who his own self and here it uses the same idea bears carries our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. Now watch this. He quotes it. By whose stripes ye were healed. Therefore, the primary point is not physical healing. The primary point is spiritual healing. It's wiping out the consequences of Satan, curse, and sin, which was all done when? When Jesus died on the cross. What a wonderful Savior we have. Because the truth is, all the consequences of sin and of Satan's attacks, he paid for when he died on the cross. He literally bore the effect of it. The literalness of this. He bore our sins. See, a lot of people in their theology think that, well, he bore the sin of what I did in the past. No, no, no. He bore all your sin. 
everything you've ever done in past or are doing now or in the future, all sin was laid on Jesus. He took care of it. He pulled out that which was destroying us. The sting is gone. There's no result anymore of sin, Satan, or the curse. It's gone. And one day, you're going to see that it's totally removed forever. And we will never get old, and we will never get sick, and we will never have pain and sorrow. Why? Because he bore our sorrows and carried our griefs. What a wonderful Savior we have. Go back to Isaiah 53. His affliction was endured for others, but secondly, it was executed according to the plan of God. Because it says, he was smitten of God. God was behind the crucifixion. People say, well, the Jews did it. No, they didn't. They couldn't even carry out the execution of crucifixion. Only the Romans could. The Romans did it, and Jesus said he'd be crucified by the Gentiles. But the theological reason is for our sins he died. And God was behind it. He was smitten of God. A lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, verse 8. Now let's come to a sixth matter. Look at verse 5 of Isaiah 53, verse 5. And that's what I call his aim. What was his aim? What was his purpose? We read in Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul said the true gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, is that Christ died for our sins. But something struck me as I was reading this uh, in the Hebrew text. Excuse me for referring to a detail, but it got me pretty excited. In verse 5, in contrast to all of this, but he... And I'm looking at the Hebrew and noticing the word he, the pronoun, it's not always like this in Hebrew. It's usually a part of the verb. Is in the emphatic position in the Hebrew text, which you should translate, he and no one else. Amen? It was he that was wounded for my and your transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement or the punishment of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed three simple things I bring to your attention number one his aim his purpose is first to redeem us from our sins he was wounded literally pierced for us to redeem us from our sins wounded bruised it says transgressions which deals with our rebellion against God and iniquity is all the corruption we get involved with. Number two, his aim was to return us to God. Not only to redeem us from our sins, but return us to God. That's the point of the word peace. The punishment literally that brought us peace was upon him. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. And look at verses 13 to 18. How beautiful to say the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. It was to return us to God. We needed his peace. And we read in Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, meaning Gentiles, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our what? Peace. Who hath made both one, Jews and Gentiles one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making what? Peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached what? Peace. To you which are far off and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The word peace means to bind together. That's why shalom is put on Jewish wedding bands. My wife has one, made by a Yemenite Jew, 84 years old, designed it. And uh, it says shalom on it, it means to bind together. It's also true in Greek, means to bind together. He bound Jew and Gentile together into one making peace 
Colossians 1.20 says, He made peace by the blood of his cross. That's how we can be returned to God. We both have access to God. Why? Because he made peace through the blood of his cross. His aim was not only to redeem us from our sins and to return us to God, but I love number three in that verse, and that's to remove the damage which sin has caused. By his stripes we are healed. In addition to 1 Peter 2.24, we have Psalm 103, verse 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all is within me. Bless his holy name. Verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. That's what we call parallelism. The point of it is, it compares forgiveth with the parallel phrase healeth. By his stripes we are healed. The primary point of that is to remove the damage. Physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever, which sin has caused, was removed. Why? And how? By the death of Jesus Christ alone. Hebrews 1.3 says, After purging, cleansing our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. No more needs to be done. Any religious system that tells you you have to make up, atone for, or do better is all a false religion. I'm not trying to make you uh, not have any responsibility or to totally relax and send up a storm. That isn't the point. It is a fact. None of the consequences of sin can be removed by any human performance or effort. I've said that so often, but I'll tell you, churches across the land are doing the exact opposite as they're developing programs by which they think people can somehow solve the problem of their own sin instead of bringing them back to the cross. You cannot clean up your act by your own efforts, no matter how wonderful they seem, no matter how much they're rooted in so-called discipleship or accountability, as important as that may be. We all want to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, but what's our motive behind it? I don't need another fence and another law put around me in order to protect me. I am protected by the blood of my Lord Jesus Christ. We have overcome the wicked one by the blood of the cross. There has never been another way. We need to bring people back to the cross and to fall on your face before God with a broken and a contrite heart and realize He is the only salvation we have. You can't straighten out your Christian life by trying to turn over a new leaf. But people are trying it all the time. They say, I'm going to do better. What kind of nonsense is that? For all of our righteousness, whatever better is to you, is like filthy rags at his sight. My Lord Jesus paid for all my sin. Every bit of it, everything I've done, can think of doing in the future, is already paid for. And that's why I can sing, Hallelujah! What a Savior! So important to understand. He removed all the damage which sin has caused completely. Let's come to number 7 in verse 6. It's like every verse here is packed. I call this his achievement. What he achieved. There's both a problem and a provision here. The problem is that all we, (laughs) we're like sheep. You know, the best of us in all of our religious intentions are going astray. Have you noticed that? If you don't go astray by setting up a storm, you go astray by the legalism of a false religious system designed to protect you from sinning. I don't know if you get this. Philosophically, it just blows my mind. Sometimes my head hurts thinking about it. The fact is, you're throwing away the merits of the cross either way you go. Either by continuing to sin or... By developing a system of legalism to protect you, which somehow keeps you from the cross once again. My, the marvel of what our Lord did. All we like sheep, what's our natural tendency? We go astray. We get away from the central issue that all sin was laid on him. That's our problem. We don't naturally go to the cross. 
We don't like it. We don't like to be humbled and broken. We don't like to see our sin and depravity and that what I need is cleansing. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I want to come up with my own system to make me feel like somehow I earned it. Oh, you and I both know you can't earn it. You can't pay for it. Nothing. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He has set us free. But we are the problem. We've turned everyone to his own way. And boy, do we have our own way. It's like Psalm 119, 176 says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. (laughs) I don't think preaching today tells us much about being sheep. I think a lot of pastors today are stroking us and making us feel better. They're talking about how good we can be. (laughs) What a waste of time. Why don't you look at Jesus? Why don't you stop looking at man? What good is it to look at man? I heard a sermon on the radio. I, I'm sorry. I, I get a funny sense of humor, I know. And I couldn't stop laughing, listening to the guy. He's a good man. He was talking about the importance of faithfulness in our life. And all I could think about is the passages from the Lord. Who's a faithful man? There is none. <laughs> and he's talking about faithfulness. Like somehow... I mean, I'm just telling you, it was a very nice presentation of how we can score points with God. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. God is faithful. There's the issue. And here we are proclaiming our own goodness and righteousness and faithfulness and what we can do, etc., etc., Why? The devil is causing the sheep who are absolutely dumb and always going astray to wander away from the finished work of Jesus Christ when he died on that cross. Why do I love him? Why do I want to serve him? It is the love of Christ for me that constrains and motivates me. The legalism of man has never done it because I am very rebellious. Everybody wants a system to make us feel good. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Come now, let's reason together, said Isaiah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white like wool. Though they be blood red like crimson, you can be white as snow. Amen? What a wonderful Savior. Because the provision is right there in that verse. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hebrews 9.28 says this. So Christ was once offered to bear... Notice how often the Bible speaks from Isaiah 53 language about bearing our sorrows and bearing our infirmities and bearing our sins. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Number 8, go back to Isaiah 53, verses 7 to 9, and that's his attitude. His attitude. Really remarkable what it says here. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and judgment, you know. And who's going to declare his generation? He had no kids. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he'd done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And as I started looking at his son, his attitude, here's what I saw. Watch this. It was seen in his silence. He opened not his mouth. Read Matthew 26 and 27 again at your leisure when you get home. Right in front of Pilate. Pilate was astonished that he didn't answer. I have the power to set you free. (laughs) 
Jesus opened not his mouth with all the accusations that came against him. And the fact of the matter is, we are told in 1 Peter 2 that that's what you and I should do when we are attacked and criticized and slandered and all that comes against us. We are to not open our blooming mouths. But commit, as Jesus did, our souls unto him who will judge righteously. For vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Well, what they did against me was not right. I'm going to go on court TV and tell them about No, no, you're not. You're going to keep quiet. They took money from me and they're not going to get away with it. We're going to go to court. No. No, you're going to let the Lord take care of it. You're going to follow the example of our Lord who suffered for us and left us an example who was in a revile. When he was reviled, reviled not again. When he was threatened, he didn't return it. He opened not his mouth. His silence shows his attitude. Secondly, I see it in his suffering. He was taken from prison, from the pit, and from judgment. Oh yeah, they went through judgment. Illegal counsels that they were. They did not follow Jewish law. And he was beaten by them as well as by the Romans. He was taken from the pit. Those of you who have been to Caiaphas' house know what that's like. To be dropped down in that hole. There's stairs leading down now. But it wasn't in Jesus' day. It was totally dark. They have a little light you can turn on now so people don't get frightened. But it's totally pitch black and you're in a hole. He was taken from the pit. He was taken from judgment. We forget maybe what he went through. That's why we need to read it often. And number three, I see his attitude in his singleness. You say, what do you mean? It said, who will declare his generation? He had no wife, he had no family, he had no children, nothing. Later you're going to find out that he saw his descendants by faith. Those who would come to believe in what he did. Number four, I see it in his sacrifice. It says he was cut off. From the land of the living. That's the language of Daniel 9, 26 that says the Messiah is cut off. There's no future for him. In the prime of life, approximately 33 or 34 years old, he's cut off. Number five, I see it in his substitution. It says, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He went through it for you and for me. No complaints. He even said, not my will, but thine be done. And six, I see it in the situation of his death and burial. Verse 9 says, he made his grave with the wicked. It's interesting, also with the rich in his death. Matthew 27, 57 to 60 tells us Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. Another gospel says he was a true disciple of Yeshua, but was afraid of the religious leaders. He and Nicodemus took that body and it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. This is kind of important to me. Where my family is from, Land's End, Cornwall, England. The churches in that area have an insignia on their doors and pulpits usually. Those old stone churches that go back to 3rd and 4th century B.C. And the Engravement is about Joseph of Arimathea. The reason being, as the legend goes, that Joseph of Arimathea, before the Roman invasion in 70 AD, took two boats of women and children. Oh, there were many boats, so don't get the idea that it was the only one. They were literally dotting the Mediterranean Sea, escaping the invasion of Rome. But the legend is that he took these women and children. Most of the Jews, as you probably know from history, stopped in Spain. He kept going around Gibraltar and up the coast of France, crossed over the channel, and landed at Land's End, which is where my father was born. And so there's a lot of dedication in that area among the churches to Joseph of Arimathea. Interesting story, isn't it? I don't know if it's true or not. Got to explain something why that's there. But the fact of the matter is, our Lord according to the Bible, was buried in a rich man's tomb. Carved out of rock that no one had ever used. Interesting story. 
And number seven, I see his attitude in his sinlessness. The end of verse nine, he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 2 again, and look this time at verses 19 to 23, you'll see the point. It's applied to us. The attitude of our Lord should affect our lives as to what he went through. 1 Peter 2.19 says, this is thankworthy. This is worthy of thanks. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it when you're buffeted for your own faults and you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable or well-pleasing unto God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile or deceit found in his mouth. Direct quotation from Isaiah 53. He threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. The wonderful attitude of our Lord. And finally, number nine, back in Isaiah 53, is what I call his assignment came from the Lord himself. Interesting conclusion to this, telling us that the whole thing was planned by the Heavenly Father. The assignment came from the Lord, verses 10 to 12. And five simple things that it's based on. In verse number 10, it's based on the pleasure of the Lord. It almost seems like an oxymoron to read. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. He made his soul an offering for sin. But it says he saw his seed, his descendants. He just got through saying, who will declare his generation in verse 8. Now it says he saw them. And he'll prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So it was based on the pleasure of the Lord who does all things well. Secondly, it was based on the purpose of justifying many. In verse 11, it says, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Third, it was based on the pouring out of his soul. Verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the great. By the way, the word great in Hebrew is the same word many in this text. He will justify many and he'll divide him a portion with the many, meaning the reward that he will give them because of their faith in him when they are justified by faith. Pouring out of his soul. Why will he divide all the blessings with those who turn to him and are justified by his death? It's because he poured out his soul into death. Folks, listen to me. It's almost like the Bible is begging us to never forget what he did. All the blessings of our salvation. Because why? Because he poured out his soul to die for you and for me. And fourth, it's based on the place he took. Imagine the place he took. He was numbered with the transgressors. Luke 23, 39 to 43, tells you the story of those two transgressors. He was one of them, being crucified. They were on either side of him. And as you know the wonderful story, one of them saw clearly what he was doing and who he was, And said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And finally, number five, it was based on the provision he made for our sin. What a beautiful way to close this little section. He bore the sin of many. There they are again, the many who will be justified, the many who will uh, receive the reward from him. And he bore the sin of many who believe in him. And he made intercession for the transgressors. Hebrews 7.25 says he ever lives to make intercession for us. He bore our sins. And I say, praise the Lord. What do you say? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the suffering, 
the death, all the despising rejection you endured. Thank you that you didn't give up even though you were beaten beyond recognition. We know it was for us. It was my sin that was on him. And I deserve hell. But he in his grace and mercy gave me forgiveness and everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Lord, I pray that those listening who are not sure of their relationship to you might realize that we must believe that our blessed Lord died for our sins. That as a sinless son of God, he had no reason to die for his own sin, for he had none. As God, he could reconcile the world. He's the only one who could pay for it. And there's nothing we can do, not one work of righteousness that could ever redeem us and save us. It's only by his mercy that he saved us. And we come to praise you. I pray that those without assurance of their relationship to him might run to him now. He who stands with open arms. Wounds in those hands reminding us he died. We remember Thomas who doubted that he was resurrected when he finally saw him, fell at his feet and said, My Lord and my God. We remember the man that went home justified because he just cried out to God, beating his breast, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Help us, Lord, to put our trust in what Jesus has already done for us. We thank you, we praise you in his precious name. We ask these things. Amen.